I want to welcome all of you to a wonderful hour packed service online. I believe this is going to be powerful. I'm very excited about the message that I'm going to preach today. I believe that it is a word in season for your life. I've never shared what I'm going to share on this live service coming to you right now, but I do believe it is fresh from the throne of God. And I've got breaking news, good news, as we're fasting and praying, we're now going into the second week of a 21-day fast. And the Lord impressed me to have the church fast and pray the first few weeks and days of August and then come back like a roaring lion and regather and restart the church as far as physical attendance and gathering back together. And that is exactly what we're doing. Keep fasting, keep praying. If you want to be a part of this fast and you'd like to join, it's not too late to jump in. Prepare your spirit. Fast and pray for our kids going back to school, for all that's happening, for our economy, for our election coming up. All of these things, we need to be prayerfully seeking God's face and specifically fasting and praying and asking and petitioning petitioning God to break this horrible virus, COVID-19, off of our nation and off of the world. And the more of us that pray and fast and turn to God, I believe can move and cause heaven to hear us. And he said in 2 Chronicles, I will heal their land. So join us on this fast and there's more information that you can find out about. But I do have big breaking news we are going to regather as a church starting, listen carefully, in Orange County, California with our Orange County campus. We have secured a beautiful tent. We're going to put it right under the big cross. And if you've never seen the big cross that lights up at night at our church, you're probably seeing it on screen right now. And it's beautiful, but imagine a massive tent up under that, that will seat hundreds of people. We may go back to the old Roberts, R.W. Schambach, A.A. A. Allen days of tent revival in California and Orange County. And it's right on the main highway of Jamboree, which is, just has tens of thousands of cars. And we're going to do that August the 16th at 9 a.m. If you want to be a part of history, we are regathering as a church on August the 16th in Orange County, California. All of you in Southern California, come on in. I'll be preaching that Sunday morning live under the tent at our Orange County campus. We're going to social distance. We're going to do everything by the book. We're going to wear masks. We're going to do whatever people are comfortable doing. We're going to take every precaution that we can take, but it's time to worship God. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And here we go. And I don't think we're going to ever stop again until Jesus comes. Secondly, another massive announcement. The rest of our campuses, all of our other campuses are going to have a tent service in the month of August, August the 30th, outdoors at every one of our campuses with the exception of our Buford campus. That will be the only one that we will not have a tent service. But on August the 30th, every other campus, including Gainesville, Cummings, Spartanburg, Midtown, Orange County, and if I missed any other in there, that one's in there too. But uh, just know that we will be gathering on August the 30th for at 9 a.m., at all of those places, the pastors will be preaching under the tent, and I'll be preaching in Gainesville, and I cannot wait. And I'm going to tell you this. I'm not going to shut that church down again unless it's just some random Sunday where it snows or something. We can't have church. But I have no intentions to ever shutting our church down again until the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes again. And I'm excited about it. It's time to regather. Write those two dates down in Orange County. August the 16th in, in Gainesville and all of our other campuses, including Spartanburg and all of our campuses, will regather on August the 30th under the big tent at 9 a.m. In, in every campus. We will social distance. We'll be saying more about it. I'm excited about it. I believe you need to be too. 
In just a moment, the worship team is coming, and I'm going to bring you a message that I believe God is going to really burn into your heart. Gather your family. I want to thank all of our volunteers and all of the people who are fasting and praying, all of the people who are participating in multiple food drives. We are feeding thousands of people. We've got a big one coming up that we bought a truckload of chicken, and we're going to give it out to the community. We've done this many, many, many times through through this process of COVID-19. We just felt it's time to do it again. Thank you to those who have been helping our seniors and calling and checking up on them by the thousands. Thank you to those of you who have been providing meals to our first responders and frontline workers at hospitals. Our church has been doing that in, in most of our campuses. And most important, or one of the most important things is we have had dozens in the last few weeks, we've had so many blood drives going on at our campus and it's so critical that we have that in the middle of this pandemic. So I just wanted to say thank you and welcome to all of you on our own uh, line campus that is continually growing. And we will be starting up soon a brand new campus in Brazelton, Georgia. I know I'm hitting you with everything, but it's a lot of good that's coming. I believe we're experiencing a turnaround. I believe that it's time for the church to regather. And we're fasting and praying for 21 days. But when we come back on the 16th and we come back on August the 30th, and then the month of September, we'll be giving you exactly what we're doing. We're going to take a little break. on, and, and once we get going in September, the second week of September, I'm telling you, I believe we're going to see revival like we've never seen it before. I want to mention something else before we pray and we begin to worship. As you know, we are facing one of the most important elections in the history of the United States of America. And we never tell people how to vote. But what we do is we tell you that I believe that it is mandated in the scripture that every Christian should vote. My goodness, you need to vote your faith. Our church votes. And listen, there's only about eight weeks left that you can register if you plan to make your vote count in this upcoming election. So much is at stake. So much of the freedom, so much of concerning issues that we all hold near and dear as people of faith religious liberty, pro-life, and we can just go on and on pro-Israel. All of those things are so critical. And listen, if you're not registered to vote, you can go online right where you are and you can look there and they are, they're putting it up now what to do and you can get registered to vote in this election right where you are, right from your home. And my goodness, do you know that there are 25 million evangelical Bible-believing Christians who are not registered to vote? Please don't be one of them. Your vote really makes a difference for freedom in the world because as America goes, so the world goes. And I believe this is the time to stand like never before and let people of faith and their voice and vote matter. Make sure you get registered to vote. All right, here we go. Are you ready today to worship God? I want to say thank you for giving. Thank you for supporting the ministry. Thank you for making the ministries happen that we've been describing, all of the food distributions and the things that have been going on and so much more. We're reaching more people online than we have ever reached before. And it's because of your faithful giving, your tithes, your offerings. Continue to do that. We've not had to lay anybody off. That's a miracle. We've not had to let anybody go. That's a miracle. Do we feel it? Of course, just like you feel it. But you know what? God has been faithful and he's going to be faithful to you. So there's there's uh, ways that you can give. You can text. You can get uh, on to the online website or the app and you can be a part of, the, of helping us resource the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I thank you for that. All right, let's pray right now. Father, we love you and we praise you. We've been fasting and we've been praying and we believe there's a word from heaven today coming. So anoint the worship, anoint the praise team, anoint all that we do on this, on this service to bless people, to heal people. Even while songs are sung, let healing flow. Even while the word is preached, let healing flow. 
to those who are needing a touch from God, a miracle, a breakthrough. May the power and the presence of, lo of the Lord come and confirm to them that you're with them and that there is victory ahead of them. In Jesus' mighty name, we proclaim you are our healer, our provider, and you are our Savior and our Lord. In Jesus' name. Now, right where you are, let's enter into worship and I'll be right back with a message.
been worshiping and praising the Lord, I want you to know that people are ready to pray and agree with you. We're 21 days fasting this month. We're fasting the early part of this month, and what a great time to make your needs known, to know that somebody's praying for you. And if you have a prayer request, be sure to text the word AMEN, A-M-E-N, to 313131. If you need prayer for your family, your finances, your body, if you if you have are grieving or broken or hurting, struggling, need to know somebody's praying for you, we will pray for you. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you just tuned in and you didn't hear the big announcement at the beginning of the hour, we are regathering as a church 
under tents in the month of August, beginning, listen carefully, August the 16th in Orange County at our Orange County, California campus. August the 16th, under a big tent, I'll be preaching there the first regathering service with Pastor Ben and Carissa and all the team. And it's going to be amazing. And it's going to be beautiful. We'll social distance. We'll do all of that. But at 9 a.m. only on August the 16th in Orange County, California. And then on August the 30th in Gainesville and Cumming and all of our other campuses in Spartanburg and in Midtown and every other campus, we will be gathering wherever you're gathering and and in our buildings and outside in the parking lot, there will be tents and our pastors will be preaching the word of God. Our praise teams will be singing the praises of God and you need to be a part. Can you imagine after we fasted for 21 days and we hadn't seen each other for almost four months, what kind of glory we're going to have under the tent? It's going to feel like the Old Testament tabernacle. And I'm excited about it. I hope the glory of God comes in massive ways. And I'll be in Gainesville preaching that Sunday. But we'll, be, we'll get it out all over. And it's just going to be powerful and unbelievable. I want you right now to go with me in God's Word. And I want to take a few moments and go to the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Actually, for the sake of time, I think I'll go over to 2 Thessalonians um, chapter 1 and just verse 7. And listen to what it says. We'll back up to verse 6. Since it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. That's kind of a neat verse. If people are troubling you and, the, and they're doing it in an unjust, evil way. God said, if they trouble you, listen to this. It is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. You better not mess with God's people. And notice what he says. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. I want to keep reading for just a moment, and then I'm going to make sense, and I'll tell you where we're going. In, in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and are gathering to gather to him. That's talking about the rapture, the catching up of the saints. We ask you not to soon be shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit, don't be troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though the day of Christ has already come. He's saying some are going to try to deceive you and tell you you've missed it. The Lord has already come. He's, taught, he's writing to these people. There were false prophets. And he said, don't let stuff going on trouble you. Verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first, and that man of, of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That is a reference to the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, that is worshipped. So he sits as God in the temple, showing himself to be God. And I'm going to stop reading there, but I, 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 I won't. Let me, let me read one more in verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity, and many translations and translate correctly that word iniquity, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do until he is taken out of the way, and that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And I know you're wondering, what in the world are you reading all those verses for? Because I want to teach out of them today. God has stirred my heart. And I want to talk to you today about Satan's master plan in the end times. Satan's master plan. And the first thing I want to say to you is we see the signs of the times, as we see the, 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 the world in turmoil like it's never been before, 
There are three tremendous truths concerning the end times that are contained in the verses that I just read. The stage is set for the drama of the ages. We are seeing prophecy be so fulfilled in such a rapid pace, it's almost like the end times are in the New York Times every day when we pick up the news and read it or watch it on television. But the first thing that Paul says we are to do when we start seeing all of these things begin to happen, when we start seeing the signs of an antichrist, and and I'll explain all of that coming on the scene, the first thing he said in that verse of of verse 7 was, make sure you who are troubled rest with us. He said, number one, don't be disturbed. I want you to have peace in the middle of all the unrest, peace in the middle of all the uncertainty economically, socially, uh, and, and all of the upheaval we're seeing politically, all of that. He said, to my people, I want you, listen to those powerful words. He said, see that you who are troubled, why don't you come You who are troubled, rest with us, the King James says. You who are troubled, come on into the camp of the church and into the body of Christ and rest with us. Do not be troubled. One translation said, do not be disturbed. Another one said, do not be dismayed when you begin to see this. God's people are not to be upset and anxious and worried and fearful. Many Christians are like the nervous man who swallowed an egg, and he was nervous because he thought, if I move, it's going to break the egg uh, inside of me. If I don't move, the egg is going to hatch, and so uh, he just was absolutely paranoid. Don't get the jitters spiritually and emotionally. Know that God is in control when everything seems out of control. And that's why Paul said, you who are troubled, rest with us. Come on. We're not denying reality. These are troubling times, but there is a rest. Come, don't be disturbed. Don't get dismayed by tales of doom and gloom. Keep hope alive. We have a sovereign God who is in control and he knows what he's doing. He has a plan for his children and for his church. And listen, and I want to put that verse up over and over. You who are troubled, rest with us. I understand your paranoia. I understand your worry. I understand your, your, your needing something to help you escape. If you don't know Jesus, I would be highly alarmed. I would be highly troubled seeing what we see now going on. But you who are troubled, Come rest with us. Rest in the promises of God. Rest in what Jesus did at the cross. Rest in the fact that he said, I'm coming back in the middle of all of it. I'm going to let my plan for my children be released like never before. And so he says, you are not to allow headline hysteria to take over your mind, take over your heart, and cause you to be fearful and tormented and worried and afraid. There are three categories of people today. There are those who are afraid. There are those who don't know enough to be afraid. They're just, they're just totally oblivious to the way that things are lining up just like the Bible said they would. And then there are those who know their Bible. And those who know their Bible and know their God will be strong and do exploits. And I'm saying to you today that the hope of the world is not in politics. The hope of this world is not in the economy. The the hope of the world is not in science or medicine. The hope of the world is in Jesus Christ and his soon return. It's getting gloriously dark in the world. And one of the signs that Jesus is coming again is he said, when you see it getting gloriously dark, know that my coming is near. 
for the Lord Jesus shall appear. He said, those of you who are troubled, come rest with us. And then the next part of that verse says, for the Lord Jesus shall appear. You know, Jesus, the one who was crucified, the one who was spit upon, the one who was ridiculed, the one who was nailed to that hellish tree, that same Jesus said, I am going to appear. I'm going to appear suddenly and secretly and sweetly to my people, and I am going to catch them away when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven, the text said, which means when, when the Lord Jesus shall be. That means that's timing, and so I want you to see that he's coming on time. He's not going to be one second late. He's not going to be one second early. As a matter of fact, the prophet Malachi in the Old Testament said, to you who fear his name shall the son of righteousness, listen to this word, arise with healing in his wings. Arise is like a reference to the sun. And the sun set or the sunrise comes every morning at a set time. Two things about the sunrise. Number one, you can't hurry it up. And number two, it can't be stopped. And the same is true about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I'm going to arise with healing in my wings. And you can't hurry it up, but nothing can stop it. Nothing can stop Jesus from coming again. He's coming right on time. And I want you to understand the first thing that he says is do not be dismayed by all that is going on. Have faith in me. I will take care of you. I will provide for you. I will protect you. I will defend you. I will shelter you in my arms. Do not be dismayed. And then secondly, he says, and do not be deceived. Look at that verse in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where he says, and make sure, listen to this verse, he said, and let no one deceive you by any means for the day of the Lord, he's talking about the day when Jesus comes, will not come, listen, unless the falling away come first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now this is very, very important. He said, don't be deceived because the devil is a deceiver. One of the things that Satan will do in the end times is come as the father of lies. He will use deception. But there's a real revelation. It said Christ will not come until first the Antichrist is starting to be revealed. Well, he's talking about when he says, uh, and notice the specific wording, the man of sin. That shows you how far the human race has come. We started out with the sin of man in the Garden of Eden, and by the time it's the last days, it'll be the man of sin. There will be a man of sin. What is that? He's called the Antichrist. In verse 3, it talks about him as the man of perdition. He's called the beast in the book of Revelation. He's called the man of sin, the wicked one, the son of perdition. One of the biggest names of the Antichrist, and I thought this so amazing, is the lawless one. The lawless one. And what we're seeing is the beginning of social unrest and lawlessness in the streets of our cities and entire neighborhoods being taken over with lawlessness. And, 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 and it, it just seems like people have lost their minds and law and order is now just out of control in so many areas. It is one of the signs the lawless one is about to be revealed. The man of sin, as the scripture calls him. It goes on to describe this man in the book of Revelation, and it says he is the epitome of evil. He is a man of lawlessness. He is a champion of wickedness. Revelation 13 calls him the beast, meaning he will have the nature of a beast. He will be anti-Christ. He will be anti-church. And isn't it amazing that he said that Jesus would not come until there first be a great falling away? Well, a falling away has to do with the church and people going to church and being a part of church. And could it be that this, this shutting down of the churches is part of the Antichrist spirit trying his best 
to cause many to fall away, families and generations to fall away from the habit of coming to church and worshiping God. And there is a great falling away that has to happen before Jesus comes and before the Antichrist is revealed. He said that he's anti Christ, he's anti-church, he's anti-Israel, and he's anti-Bible. He is a counterfeit Christ. Let me, let me say it like this. Jesus said when he was on earth, I am God in skin. I am God in the flesh. And then he made this powerful, powerful statement. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, the Antichrist comes as a man of lawlessness and iniquity. And he will say the same thing. If you're seeing me, you're seeing Satan in skin. You, can you imagine? He will be the devil in flesh. He will be the devil incarnate. He will be the son of Satan wearing clothes. All the Hitlers, all the Stalins, all of the mass murderers and the serial killers and the, and the brutal, brutal, vicious, mean, evil people all in one body. Now, he won't look like a monster. The Bible is very clear. And what, what will he do? He will exalt himself, the scripture said. He will exalt himself above God. He has always wanted worship. He's going to, there's clearly a piece of land called the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And the Jews there are already organizing and wanting to rebuild the temple. And he's going to move into that. When we go to the Holy Land, there's a museum that we go to sometimes and they are already making by rabbinical law and rules the silver trumpets that were used. They're already getting ready for Messiah. They've already made the menorah, and they've made the wash lever, uh, uh, pots, and they've even uh, made the, uh, the, the box that they will cast the lots for the scapegoat. And you can go in that museum and see them and see that they're already wait, waiting there. And it, all that I'm saying to you is simply this. Satan has always, in Isaiah 14, he said, I'll, I'll exalt myself before the throne of God and I'll set myself up and I'll cause people to worship me. And when the Antichrist comes, he will come and he will not only take over the world, but he will cause worship to leave the church, leave God. Now the church is going to be taken out, and I'll explain that in a moment. But notice what it says in verse 3. It says the Antichrist will be revealed. The word revealed means exposed, shown for who he is. It means that when the coming of Jesus is near, it can't happen. The coming of Jesus can't be near unless the beast is here, which tells me, I believe with all of my heart, I, that the coming of the Lord is near. Therefore, I believe that the Antichrist, the beast, is alive and well on this earth. The unveiling of the beast is what we're beginning to see in our world as we are watching things that we never dreamed would take place in our lifetime. Now listen to what verse 6 and verse 7 says. They are so important. And you know that, that that which restrains, listen to this, that that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work. The mystery of lawlessness, he said, will start to show itself just before the beast will be revealed, but before the beast is revealed, Jesus will come again. And I'm telling you, when I got to studying this, I began to see we are seeing the spirit, the mystery of iniquity. I looked that up, and it said there is a spirit of wickedness, a spirit of filth and debauchery, the spirit of antichrist, um, is, is, is one translation said a devilish conspiracy, a devilish conspiracy. We are up against brilliant, invisible, tireless demon spirits, and it's called a devilish conspiracy, the mystery of lawlessness and iniquity. The Bible declares that that spirit is being held back. Now, this is the good news, and I want you to get excited about this. 
Because the Bible said in verse 7, now he who restrains, and the word restrains, and the Bible declares that that spirit is being held back. Now he, the King James says, he that letteth, the word let means to restrain. So who is the restrainer? Who's holding back the hordes of hell from taking over? Who's holding back the Antichrist from being revealed? Who's holding it back? He tells you who. There is someone who has Satan on a leash. Satan cannot do everything he wants to do. Someone is restraining Satan, Superman, the Antichrist. And do you know who it is? Do you know who it is? It's the precious Holy Spirit. He cannot have his way as long as the Holy Spirit is on this earth. And let me make this point big. The Holy Spirit lives in us. He doesn't live in buildings. He said, your body is my temple. This is why when the rapture takes place and Christians are taken out, we take all the Holy Spirit that's here. He goes with us. Then the Bible said, as long as he's here, which means as long as we're here, we are the restraining force. The Holy Spirit has a twofold ministry right now through you. And that's why Satan hates you. He hates Christian families. He hates Christian churches. He hates Christian preachers. He hates anybody because we are the restrainers. We are the one that holds back the hordes of hell from taking over this world. If you haven't seen anything, you need to see that we could lose our freedom like that. We could be thrown into concentration camp. We could see the economy crash. All of that is being restrained by one thing, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a twofold ministry. Number one, to help the saints. He's called the comforter, and he's here to empower and help us, but to hinder Satan. Hallelujah. And he's doing both at the same time. He's helping the saints, and he's hindering Satan. And no wonder the devil hates church. No wonder we got governors who are saying, I won't even let them get together and making law that you can't sing, you can't pray, you can't chant. Well, we don't care anymore. We've just had about all that we can have. And we are going to sing, and we're going to shout, and we're going to restrain the forces of evil and give our children and our children's children a little bit more time to win the world, and then Jesus is coming again. The Holy Spirit in us will be taken out of the church. The believers that are full of the Holy Spirit will be taken out, and then the roadblock on Satan's superhighway will be removed. And when that happens, when we leave, hell will have a holiday. Hell unrestrained will begin to take over this world. The Bible said that we're the salt of the earth, Salt purifies, salt preserves, salt decontaminates, and salt stings and irritates. And I want you to know the church irritates those people who hate God. The church irritates and believers irritate and sting when, when we preach the gospel, that old-fashioned mess, why do you stand up? Why do you preach? Why do you, why do you not just let us live any old way? And we still preach that man and woman ought to be married, and that's holy unto God. And we still teach that life is, is precious, and a baby shouldn't be killed in the womb. That's holy unto God. And we still teach the Word of God and the grace of God in every way, and it irritates the enemy, and it irritates the people that have the devil in them. I don't know any other way to say it. When the Holy Spirit stands aside, then there is going to be a putrefaction of the whole world, and it's coming. Darkness will engulf the whole globe. Hell will have a holiday. A flood of wickedness will come. It's called the Great Tribulation, and then the Antichrist will come. But praise God for that restrainer. And Satan's master plan is tied to a master man, his ma master man, and he's the Antichrist. He will turn this world into a concentration camp. Revelation 3.18 says every inmate will be numbered with a number, and that number is 666. And it says in that same verse that without that number, no man will be able to buy or sell. No sign, no sale, no mark, no merchandise. And how is all this organized? Through computers. We wouldn't have believed this 20 years ago, 30 years ago. 
But now if you have pets, they can, they can the size of a grain of, uh, of rice can put in your dog's ear and can know where that dog is, a little computer. They can put it in your body and it can carry your whole history. And there's coming a day when there will be a cashless society. The Bible predicts it clearly in Revelation 13 and 8. The, the more machines act like men, computers are taking over. And the more machines act like men, the more men will act like machines. They'll fall right in order. They'll fall right. When the church is gone, when the restrainer is gone, when the people of God are gone, then will come the Antichrist, the revealing of the beast. He will immediately for seven years begin his reign and it'll be three and a half years of a global charmer. He'll be handsome. He'll be powerful. He'll bring economic prosperity, not just to America, but all over the world. It'll look beautiful. But there will also come to any, and there will be people who are saved during the tribulation, and there will come days of torture and terror for anyone left behind who believes in Jesus Christ and refuses to take the mark of the beast. But here's what he said to you and me, and I'm almost closed. He said, number one, when you see all this starting to happen, don't be disturbed. You who are troubled, come rest with us. Hallelujah. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm just making sure I'm getting my family on board. I'm making sure that I'm, that I'm ready. I'm making sure that my eyes are focused on the prize. You who are troubled, come rest with us. You who are disturbed, don't be disturbed. And then secondly, he said, don't be deceived. The Antichrist will come with lies and many Christians are turning away from holiness and living the truth and, and loving and it's being, the gospel's being mixed with this and that and this and that and it's not a pure gospel. Don't be deceived. The Bible said that even the very elect will get, will get deceived by stuff that'll get them into other things that pull them away from the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. But then it ends with a powerful thought. Don't be disturbed. Don't be deceived. Don't be disappointed. You will not be disappointed because verse 8 says this, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom God will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. It's then that 666 will be taken over by 777. <laughs> There's coming a day when 666, all of evil, all of hell, all that Satan has got is going to come face to face with 777. And when 666 meets 777, 777 is going to consume him with his breath God's going to give him one word. You know what that word's going to be? Drop dead. And when he does, all of the beast, the false prophet, the antichrist, isn't that something? The devil's a mimic. He mimics everything. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then there's, there's the, you know, the antichrist, there's Satan, and there's the false prophet, an unholy trinity. But with one breath, he'll consume them. We won't be disappointed when our Savior comes. We won't be disappointed when he splits the eastern skies. We won't be disappointed when we come riding back with him and set up his kingdom and rule. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess Jesus is Lord. We don't need to be dismayed. We don't need to be deceived because we will not be disappointed. Everything he's promised, everything this book is predicted and prophesied is coming together in astonishing ways. And I'm telling you that we need to open our eyes. The book of Revelation says, and I saw a dragon talking about the last days. And isn't it interesting that China's emblem is a dragon? And this, and nothing against the Chinese people. God loves the Chinese people. But there is a demon that has been assigned to that oppressive. They have prison camps. I saw it on the news the other day in chains. And they have secret 
surveillance of showing thousands and thousands of Christians and people of faith who are being oppressed in prison camps and concentration camps not 150 years ago, right now. And that dragon spirit has released a virus on the world and we see what is going on in the economy and everything else. Boy, it's all happening. My point is it's all happening. Just like the Bible said, Jesus said there you would see plagues and there would come these moments that men's hearts would trouble. But here's his word. Don't be disturbed. You who are troubled, come rest with us. Don't be deceived just because everybody else is turning away and falling away and going back to wickedness. Don't be deceived. Stay true to God because if you do, you will not be disappointed. He's coming just like he said he would. Now I want to pray for you and your family. I want to pray for you to be ready. Wouldn't you want to be ready? Don't you want Jesus to be your Lord? Don't you feel an urgency after hearing this message? I don't want to miss the coming of Jesus Christ. Pray for me. I want to. And if there's a need in your life right now, I want you to go. And I want you to text the word, amen, A-M-E-N, 313131. Pray this prayer with me, everybody. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my family. I give you my sin. I believe the word is true. I believe just like the prophecies of your first coming were fulfilled. I certainly believe you lived and you died and rose again for me. And I believe that the same book is telling me the truth that I've heard him preach today. I receive you, Jesus, as my Savior and get me and my family ready for the soon return of Jesus Christ. So what are we to do? What are we to do, Pastor? Pray for your loved ones. Win souls. Start sharing messages like this. Begin to fast and pray with me in these end times that God would cause great light to come on the church and through the church. Comfort one another. Keep faith, hope, and love alive in times like these. Run to the arms of God. I plead the blood of Jesus over every home. I plead the blood of Jesus over every person watching me today by television, by internet, wherever this is being seen. I claim miracles in people's lives, especially of deliverance and salvation. Let backsliders come home. We love you. We're praying for you. And now is the time, like never before, to be very sure your heart is right with God. It starts with you and then get your family saved. Get them saved. Go after souls now like never before. And now as you continue to fast and pray with us into this second week, remember what I'm teaching you and come back next week. We're going to bring you part two. You heard Satan's master plan. You're going to hear more about this one called the Antichrist, the Lord willing, next week right here online. And by the way, even though we'll be having services in the tent on August the 16th in Orange County only, in Orange County only, and then August the 30th in our Gainesville and South Carolina campus campuses, we will be having August the 30th under the tent. I'll be there live in Gainesville, but we'll have tents at all of our campuses. We're coming back. And we're going to have a beautiful, beautiful first Sunday. And I believe it's going to be powerful. And you don't want to miss it. And then we're going to, we will be coming back for good in the buildings, in the buildings on that second week of September, right after Labor Day. We will be gathering and social distancing. And as I said, we're going to keep the church, oh, I don't, I don't know how many will show up, but we're going to keep it going until Jesus comes, the Lord willing. And I agree with you that we're going to win more souls than we've ever won before. Let me pray for you the blessing. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine on you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you peace. I love you. God bless you.